Okay, th thanks very much. Um, just a quick welcome to, thank you for your viewers for coming today. Obviously, I see a lot of familiar faces from the uh, the RPAS panel, so there's um, but there's obviously some other people as well who are clearly the, the target for our, our, our event today. And we'll, we'll go around the room in a little while just to um, check out who's here and who isn't. But um, just a quick few introductions from the front, first of all. Uh, my name is Jerry Corbett. I'm, uh, I'm from the United Kingdom Civil Aviation Authority. I'm one of the co-rapporteurs for Working Group 5 of the RPAS panel, which is the one that's dealing with um, the RPAS operations side of things. To my left here is uh, Ron van der Leijgraaf, who's uh, my other co-rapporteur from the, the Netherlands Ministry of Transport. Again, we've been involved in the, um, the RPAS panel and the Amand Aircraft Systems Study Group, which was its pre-runner pre for um, quite a number of years now, almost since it started itself. So just a, a big welcome to, to say hello to both of you today, um, to all, all of you rather. Um, just to reiterate as much as anything, this is a, a general briefing, a familiarisation really aimed at the... Um, at those of you that are not completely familiar with the uh, the operations of unmanned aircraft and and how they work and it sets the scene for um what we've um created so far in terms of a, a new part to annex six for dealing with remotely piloted aircraft systems itself but we'll talk a little bit more of that in a minute first of all though i'd like to introduce mark wunenberg from the uh um okay secretariat here we'll just go through some of the the admin side of things for the days Thanks, Jerry. Uh, just a bit of administration. Uh, first of all, those that have their phones with them, obviously, if you could please put them uh, on silent or vibrate, we'd appreciate that. Uh, if there's any sort of a fire, obviously out either one of the doors and out the nearest uh, fire exit. Uh, as this is a room with uh, the communication system, uh, please uh, no uh, bringing of food or drink into the room. Uh, if you happen to have some with you at the moment, please put it on the floor or secure it otherwise uh, off the tables. Um, we'll talk about the schedule here in a sec. Uh, those that are sitting further back, if you would like to move forward, there is room available just because there's a nameplate there. Uh, that's okay. Feel free to move forward if you wish to. Uh, that's all I've got. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, just as I say, it's a, a concept brief, really, for um, the, the introduction of Avanex 6 Part uh, 4, as we've um, drafted it to date, to get you familiar with the things before we ultimately pass it out to, um, to the other parts of the ACAO, the panels, and uh, other specialist groups for, for comments as well from there. Just a, a quick run through the, the idea for the, the day, the run as much as anything. So it's a two-day session, two afternoons um, in, involved in things. This afternoon uh, essentially is the high level sort of introduction to things. We, we start with a, a fairly high level introduction to operations itself um, and that will be conducted by uh, two of our other colleagues who I'll introduce a little bit later. And then we have two sessions of, of each which will have two scenarios of um, remotely pilot aircraft system um, operations or how we, we perceive them happening. Um, and the intent is that those operations run from a relatively simple sort of operation to start with up until potentially some of the, the more complicated items. And the aim is to, as we go through those, just bring out some of the, the newer points that are certainly RPAS specific or unmanned aircraft specific and then as we get further in we add the other com um, complications of going further away landing in other air aerodromes and um, crossing boundaries going to other places and using different providers but I, I won't cover the uh, the full discussion now of course because um, I'll spoil it for the rest of the day can I have the second slide please uh, then tomorrow um, it's really down to the pretty much the Ron and Jerry show, so it'll be us two tomorrow. I'll, I'll try and keep my mouth shut uh, for most of today, if possible. But but tomorrow you'll get um, alternating presentations from myself and Ron with regard to um, Annex 6 Part 4 itself. And whilst we're not going to take you through it line by line and, and start by start, because that would be intensely dry, and it's a dry enough subject already, we'll, um, the intent is to cover the, the three main areas um, the three main sections of the um, of the the part four that we've created, and then just talk you through some of the main bits there that again are 
are new to um, aviation or sort of remotely piloted aviation side of things. So that's the, the general side of things for the day. Um, in terms of the, the general running for the day, the aim is to we'll, we'll let the people, the various people do their presentations and then we'll, um, we'll have a question and answer session at the end of each one from the end. Um, the questions will generally be answered hopefully by the, the presenter because it's their presentation that's done it mainly. Um, if they get a bit struggling, then Ron and I will have a go. If not, we'll open it to some of the, the other experts uh, in the floor as necessary. So that's the, that's the general idea for the day. It's very much aimed at um, presenting the expanded concept of um, operations of aircraft within um, over in, in international operations, but with the, the unmanned um, specific the, uh, um, subjects added to it from there. Um, I will add one thing, though, that bear in mind that we're not putting forward a specific solution when we come to you. This is a concept, this is aircraft that can be flown by pilots or are piloted from elsewhere. It's not like the ACAS equivalents or perhaps some performance-based nav uh, ideas when you pass, when there's been actual product to turn into SARPs. In this case, we have more of a concept itself, which then has to be turned into SARPs. So none of this is our product, our, our aircraft. You know, there's a specific aircraft in mind. It's, it's a much wider uh, concept than that that has to be um, developed. So just bear that in mind throughout, that there's, there's not one set um, um, product being thought of whilst we're, we're going on from here. Um, other than that, I think uh, the only thing I'll, I'll perhaps ask is if you can just go around from uh, front left, uh, Mark, I'll get Mark to start, and, and just introduce yourself very briefly. If you're part of the RPAS panel, just give your name and say you're part of the RPAS panel. If you're not from the RPAS panel, you're the target audience that we're really interested in. And by all means, if you want to come further forward, feel, please feel free to do so. The names um, aren't allocated for anybody in specific here. But um, that's the general aim is if you, if you name yourself, if you're from the RPAS panel, just leave it at that. If you're not from the RPAS panel, it'd be good to hear where you're from and um, your, your general interest in, in why you've come today. So we'll start on the uh, over the right there with Mark. Mark Stubbs from the RPAS panel. Uh, Leslie Carey, the IKO RPAS program manager. Hello, Matthias Grall from Working Group 3 RPAS panel. Chris Weider, RPAS panel. Don Nellis, RPAS panel. Filippo Tomasello, equally RPAS panel. Albert Mussettini, RPAS panel. Gerhard Lipic, RPAS panel. Francesco Lelizzotti, RPAS panel. Stuart Curtis, RPAS panel. Ricardo Elise, RPAS panel. Michael Linden Burnley, RPAS panel. Silver Book, uh, Transport Canada, uh, Civil Aviation Inspector from the Task Force. Andrew Ward, RPAS panel. John Taylor, also part of the RPAS panel. Victor Robeck, IATA, Flight Operations. Elena Gromova, RPS PEP panel. Sergei Shevrin, RPS panel. Edward Felkov, RPS panel. Good afternoon, Zeno Welsersheim. Um, I'm head of the Flight Operations Department of the Austrian Aviation Authority, Austro Control. And uh, panel member on behalf of the ABIS group for the Annex 6 panel, flight ops panel. Catherine Ronflinado, Airpass panel. Michel Goubert, Airpass panel. Thomas Yacono, DJC France, from the flight ops panel. Patrice Deballé, Airpass panel. Good afternoon. And John Swigert from the Airpass panel. Chris Hope from FAA Flight Standards. I'm the U.S. member to the Flight Operations Panel. Thomas Walsh, our press panel. Frederick Nordstrom, our press panel. Scott Blum, representing the ICCAIA from the Flight Ops Panel. Takeshi Tomoda, our press panel. Takashi Kono, our press panel. Shigemitsu Aoki, also. Hiroki Tokunaga from RPAS panel. Yoshiro Tsuno, RPAS panel. Mitsuru Takashi, RPAS panel. Uh, David Shim, RPAS panel, working group three. Uh, Hiroki Kim, RPAS panel. Sengen Kim, RPAS panel. 
Frédéric Mello, ICAO Secretariat, Our Pass Program. Philip Dawson, ICAO Secretariat, Our Pass Program. Denis Jouvin, Our Pass Program. Kevin Morgan, FAA, I'm on the awareness panel. Bushra Shekhar from our past panel. Oz Özbal, our past panel working group two. Ibrahim Bayram, our past panel working group five. Nico Forbach, Kanzo, Director IKO Affairs. Lance King, our past panel. Oh. Andreas Udovic, our past panel. Jan Picard, NAV Canada, Air Traffic Management Operations Panel, Canada's advisor. Yep. Hans Berlin, our press panel. Jim Powell, our press panel. Thomas Mildenberger, our press panel. Liu Hao, our press panel. Wa Kong Bing, our press panel. Uh, Zach Ang, second D to the AMO section of IKO. Terry Lock, IKO, AMO. Rachel Deschler, uh, ICAO Air Navigation Bureau Safety Branch. Miguel Ramos, AMB as well. Courtney Robinson, ICAO Air Transport Bureau. Pat, Pat Sharma, ICAO Delegations, Nigeria. Adrian Hughes, RPAS Panel. Jean Francois Groux, RPAS Panel. Alex de la Torre, Arpas Panel. Yukanla, Arpas Panel. Francine Zimmerman, Arpas Panel. Fiona Kayser, Arpas Panel. Tracy Lamb, Arpas Panel. Steve Plishka, Arpas Panel. Alan Hobbs, Arpas Panel. Michael Sona, Arpas Panel. Good afternoon, Randy Willis, the Arpas Panel. Stefan Ronick, Arpas Panel. Dominique Collin, Arpas Panel. Michael Neal, Arpas Panel. Wim van Leijden, Arpas Panel. Chris Lake, Arpas Panel. Brian Gimo, Arpas Panel. David Scora, ICAO Operational Safety Section. Ian Knowles, ICAO Flood Ops Panel Secretary. Elizabeth Ganim, Safety Management Panel Secretary. Steve Cook, our past panel. Leah Hanrahan, our past program office. Okay, I think that's about it. Thanks, thanks very much for that. Um, those of you that aren't from the RPAS panel, the, the few of you from, from not will notice that there's quite a few people here from the RPAS panel. Um, I will point out that there are extra, another load of people from the RPAS panel that are not here as well, so it's, it's probably one of the biggest panels that we have at the moment, but we're split into, um, into seven working groups, of which working group five has about um, between 20 and 25 people on it. So that's where we're, we're concentrating on uh, today, but it's, it's good to see you. Thanks very much for coming along, and we'll, we'll start off with the, uh, the next bit. So I'll hand over to Ron now for that. Okay, thank you, Jerry. Good afternoon, everybody. Can you get me the... Next slide, Mark, or the next presentation even. That's, uh, I'll get you through a, uh, a bit of the process that we intend to, to go through with, uh, with uh, part six of Annex 4. Up to now, it's uh, been discussed within our working group, within the ARPAS panel, and uh, we have had one uh, round of consultation with the Flight Ops panel last year, and now we are facing a, a, a second round and we are including a bit more of uh, the external experts group in that and I just want to take you through a timeline to show you uh, where we are exactly and what at what stage what is expected from you so uh, if I can get the next one uh, mark so this is the uh, this week's meeting uh, focusing on this concept brief and we will start to look into uh, developing the uh, impact assessment for the, the SARPs as well, so they can go together. Next, please. Uh, the external groups that we are targeting for comments will receive uh, part four, draft text of part four, Annex six, uh, during this week, uh, Monday at the latest. 
and by probably mid-October we will we will ask you to provide us uh, with some comments. We know that that uh, might be uh, a bit of an issue with the flight ops panel because they're just uh, meeting prior to our uh, fall meeting uh, in October. So we will we'll, we'll deal with Ian about that, how we can best handle the, the comments through the flight ops panel. But for all the others, it is intended that uh, by roughly mid-October, you will get, uh, we will ask you for comments on our draft sharps. Next, please. Then in November or end of October, we have our fall meeting. We will review the, uh, the comments received, uh, uh, adapt the text accordingly, uh, provide answers to the comments if necessary, and then we will uh, send the document, the draft part four, out again. Again to the expert group, so you get a second round of uh, checks and balances and see if we've uh, handled your comments properly and then it will also go to the uh, the various working groups within the RPAS panel and uh, then we basically give you two meetings time to to look at uh, the document and give us comments in the meantime we have the the, the spring meeting of 2019 panel meeting number 13 we will continue working on the impact assessment and the RPAS manual update which needs to be done as well and then prior to the next uh, next one, please, Mark. Uh, so somewhere in May will be the deadline for the second round of comments in preparation for our uh, June 2019 meeting. Next, please. So during that meeting, we will uh, look for the we will resolve the comments received in the second round from the expert groups and from the uh, the various other groups within the panel. We're going to look for endorsement uh, at, uh, at or just after that meeting, and from there on it gets into the, the hands of the Secretariat for comments. And we will not be so gentle with the Secretariat because they only have one meeting to deal with, uh, with the comments, but they're supposed to be more familiar with our work after, by then, what was it, 14 panel meetings. So they will have a deadline of providing the comments just prior to the, the fall meeting of 2019. And, next, uh, and then we will re revise the text again according to the comments from the Secretariat. We will hopefully get their endorsement during the meeting as well. And then by the next meeting in 2020, it's out of our hands and it's getting into the ICAO formal SARPs uh, process and Filippo during one of the presentations uh, just after me will we'll, we'll provide some dates with that as well. So our target is to have it finished with various cycles of, uh, of comments from externals and from other panel members and from the Secretariat by 2020 and get into the formal SARPs approval status. And that's it for me I guess. So I think it's time to go to the the content presentations and before we uh, show some scenarios operational scenarios in which we want to show uh, the, the specificities of uh, flying ARP as compared to manned aircraft I think it's uh, it's good to have a high level introduction to our thinking and uh, the the issues that we have been dealing with in the, both the study group and the panel so i would like to ask filippo and patrice to come up here and do the first presentation Thanks to Ron and thanks to all the colleagues which are in the room to participate to this briefing. I am Filippo Tomasello and uh, I am a citizen of the European Union of ne Neapolitan nationality and in the ARPAS panel I am observer on behalf of UVS International. Uh, I have prepared with this presentation with my friend Patrice de Vallée and he will introduce himself in a moment. Uh, since before drafting any SARPs, of course, we had to discuss a concept behind them. 
And so now we are trying to summarize, which is our present status after 10 years of work since the beginning of the UAS study group. So first we will try to set the scene. Unfortunately, even in this domain, there are few acronyms. You know that this is a bad habit of aviation. And the core of the presentation would be the main principles, not for UAS operations, but for ARPAS operations, international ARPAS operations, which are a subset, because this domain is much wider than traditional aviation. So let's start from setting the scene. Of course, we do not work in a vacuum. We start from a number of documents, which are already there. And sometimes I like to say that Annex 7 is a forgotten Annex in ICAO. Normally, we never speak about Annex 7. But for me, it is quite important, because there is a paragraph there since 2000. 12, saying that any aircraft can be manned or unmanned. So that's the basis to state that UAS are unmanned aircraft. They are not aerial vehicles. Anything which is lifted by the reactions of the air is an aircraft. And this principle is enshrined in Annex 7. Then in 2012, ICAO amended Annex Two, rules of the air to amendment 43 which was a strange amendment which went a little bit beyond rules of the air but it has put the cornerstones for integrations of ARPAS not in the airspace but in the total aviation system and this is better detailed in the manual which you see uh, the line below DOC 10019 so it says first you need to be legally compliant with the convention. Second, you need to register your, your aircraft. Third, you need a certificate of airworthiness. Then you need licensed pilots. Then you need an operator, which has an ARPAS operator certificate, the equivalent of the air operator certificate in part one of Annex 6. And only once you have these regulatory approvals, the operator may plan to file a flight plan and decide which is the route and plan to integrate the machine into the airspace. So airspace comes at the end, not at the beginning of the process. After this amendment to Annex 2 and the manual published in 2015, ICAO in 2017 has published the concept of operations, CONOPS, to better specified which is the scope of the work which we are undertaking in this panel, which is indeed international IFR operations in controlled airspace. No more than that. Uh, currently, the panel is also working, as Ron said a few minutes ago, on the second edition of the manual, the DOC 10019, and of course, whatever might emerge today and tomorrow will influence the progress of our work for both the SARPs and the second edition of the manual. So the task of the panel, like any panel in this house, is to develop SARPs, to develop related guidance material, and differently from EASA in Europe, not only for the safety of ARPAS, but even for security and efficiency. The mandate of ICAO is a bit larger. And in fact, on some of our SARPs, we speak about security aspect. Of course, the purpose is to at least maintain the current level of safety of international civil aviation. And the priority is IFR operations in controlled airspace. Uh, this may look a little bit strange, because usually in aviation we think that VFR is simpler than IFR. Yes, this was at the time of the Wright brothers. But today, with the automation which we have on unmanned aircraft, and with the fact that the pilot is not on board, IFR is much easier than VFR. 
industry is investing to develop IFR, and so for the moment we don't think that we should spend a lot of time on international unmanned operations under VFR. Actually, I have not seen even in the states, the states which I have seen, they are not wasting uh, dedicating effort to VFR for unmanned aircraft. So uh, the world, the universe of remotely piloted aircraft is already wide, but around it there is an even wider universe of unmanned aircraft system. So unmanned aircraft can be model aircraft. A model aircraft has no pilot on board, but flights and can be controlled. But of course, in ICAO we do not need to standardize model aircraft. Small unmanned aircraft. Someone calls them drone. Journalists call drones everything. Even the Global Oak is a drone for some journalists. But here we tend to say that drones or small UAS are those below 25 kilograms. The ones which today are proliferating in the world and ones which are the most urgent problem for the majority of the competent authorities. But in the panel, we will not standardize them. Then we may have unmanned free balloons. We have them in Annex 2 since 1981, if I remember. In ICAO, we are only looking at RPA, remotely piloted aircraft of sufficient performances and endurance to cross international borders. So even inside the domain of RPA, ICAO is only standardizing the RPA used for international operations. So do not expect that we will propose the solution for all the problems which contracting states may have in this field of UAS. Because historically ICAO has never standardized everything. We do not have detailed standards on airships or gliders. So even in the case of drones, we will, standard, we will propose to standardize only what is relevant on the global scale. Uh, so we will standardize or propose to standardize remotely piloted aircraft. Technology may allow autonomous flight without a pilot at all, not even on the ground. This is out of scope. Maybe in a few years we'll come back, but today we are not working on them. As well, we are not working on very low level operations, below 500 feet above ground level, because we don't think that these operations are relevant on the international scale. As well, we are not working on very high level operations about flight level 600. We are not working on ARPAS, on RPA, when carrying persons. We read on the press that there are projects underway, but most of them are called uh, air taxi or drone taxi, and they are supposed for the time being to work on a relatively short range. So they are not yet mature to be considered for international standardization. Of course, by definition, ICAO does not dictate any standards for domestic operations. Model aircraft are out of scope, as I told you one moment ago. And of course, state aircraft, based on Article 3 of the Convention, are also out of scope. Don't be scared by this slide. It contains only four batches of deliveries. There are 200 boxes, but we don't need to go one by one. So uh, this panel has already delivered a proposal to amend Annex 1, and including in Annex 1 the remote pilot license. This went through the usual procedure per Article 90 of the Convention. It has been adopted by Council three months ago, and it would become applicable at the end of 2022. This is the first batch. Probably at the end of this week, the panel will recommend to the Air Navigation Commission the second batch, which comprises mainly Annex 8, airworthiness of RPA, and 
a new volume of Annex 10 with some fundamental provisions on command and control link. And this would be the second batch, which you can see highlighted in yellow. Then we are working, where there is the ellipsis on the left of the slides, on Annex 6. As Ron said, the, this panel expects to recommend this in March 2020, so two years of consultation, and then the resulting test recommended by the ENC in 2020. Annex 6, Part 4, will be accompanied by Annex 19, where we will have to introduce some new pro service providers. But if we don't have Annex 6, we cannot amend Annex 19. So they will go together to the Air Navigation Commission. And then what remains is in pink, is the last bit, standards for detect and avoid. So we have decided to split this in batches in order to have more maturity and more consultation, but also not to overload the system. In this moment, we expect that this the complete block of this first generation of standards would be applicable in, at the end of 2024. If God so wants, I will be 74 in that year, and so then I can retire and I will no longer trouble you, but not yet. And part of this work is a new part four of Annex 6, which is quite a, an innovation in ICAO, because you know that we already have part one, two, and three, but a fil rouge behind these parts is that commercial air transport is regulated more severely than general aviation. In the field of RPAS, there is no longer this distinction. Whether the flight is commercial or non-commercial, the standards are the same. Why? Because there are no people on board. The risk is for third party in the ground or in the air, which are not involved in the operations, they may be unaware, and so we have to protect these people in the same way, regardless of the purpose of the operation. And another major innovation, if you read the current four award of Annex 6, it says that aerial work is not standardized by ICAO. ARPAs today carry out mainly aerial work, much more than transport. And so this new part four will cover, for the first time in history of ICAO, even aerial work. Uh, the timetable. Ron said that in 2020, in March, we intend to recommend to the panel this uh, new part four of Annex 6 to be endorsed and transmitted to the Air Navigation Commission, and then there will be the usual procedure per Article 90. If everything goes smoothly as planned, we might expect the adoption by Council at the beginning of 2022, and if the Council will so want, most probably applicability at the end of 2024. Uh, two years also, because meanwhile we will wait for the SARPs for detect and avoid, uh, without which it is difficult to have operations in non-segregated uh, controlled airspace. And then I spoke too much until now, so with your permission I will end over to my friend Patrice. And the word end over will come back. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Filippo. Uh, so it's a um, great pleasure that I'm sharing these slides with uh, uh, Filippo's today. So I'm Patrice de Valle from the French Civil Aviation Administration, French uh, Civil Aviation Authority, and I'm working as well in the Working Group 5 of the APAS panel. So uh, next slide. So this is just a boring slide uh, with all the acronyms. So. I'll go quickly through it, and anyway, we will recall all the acronyms for each slide when, when we uh, go, to, uh, go to this. But the most important ones are, of course, RP, which is Remote Pilot, uh, RPA, Remotely Piloted Aircraft, RPAS, 
remotely piloted aircraft system. Our peak, which is rem remote pilot in command. Uh, RPL, remote pilot license. RPS, which we'll use a lot, remote pilot station. So uh, the, main, the main slide will be about the principle, which are the main assumptions that we've been work, working on within Working Group 5 and within the panel. So most of them are stabilized and stable, but uh, the, the workshop today will maybe uh, uh, exchange with you, will help us with, with some of these, or new principles maybe will, will be found. So the main principle behind the RPS uh, operations is that for a given flight, there is only one operator holding what we call a ROC, repass, RPS, sorry, operator certificate. And uh, this certificate relates to the uh, entire RPAS system, uh, which is also exclusively uh, tied to one RPA. And so the operator is, uh, is responsible for the whole flight. So you can see on the picture here that the RPAS operator controls like every component of the system. So what are more precisely these com components? So a uh, system, uh, ARPA system is composed of one RPA, which is the aircraft, one or more RPSs, stations, uh, and these RPA and RPSs are connected by the C2 link, command and control link. And this link can be either in radio line of sight or beyond radio uh, line of sight. Other components which are essential for the flight include navigation equipment, flight control computer, flight management system, autopilot, also health monitoring, the ATS communication surveillance, and also uh, we can use also launch and recovery equipment like a catap catapult, winch, rocket, a nut, why not, parachute, airbag, you name it. Also, it can be a dual or triple uh, C2 link and also possibly a flight termination system, allowing the intentional process to end uh, the flight in a controlled manner. So RPS, this slide is more about the station. So it's a component of the AirPass system containing the equipment used to pilot the aircraft, the remotely piloted aircraft. So it's kind of a remote cockpit, which is located, for example, on the ground, but not only, it could be located uh, it could be stationary or mobile. Example given, it could be in a vehicle, on a ship, on another aircraft, or possibly also in international waters. And we'll see afterwards some scenarios dealing with, with this uh, situation. Also, the C2 link connects the, the station and the aircraft uh, for managing the flight and also possibly communicating with ATC. It may be, in, uh, as we said, in ra radio line of sight or beyond. The remote pilot is essential. This is a person charged by the operator with duties essential to the operation of, of the aircraft and who, within this station, manipulates the flight controls as appropriate during the flight. Uh, using the C2Link, the remote pilot in command uh, is expected to have continuous control over the RPA under normal operating conditions. And a loss of C2Link is considered as a, 
a contingency or an emergency situation. Only one remote pilot may hold a remote pilot in command responsibility at any, at any given time. Also, the following principle, our assumption is that only one remote pilot in command can only pilot one RPA at any given time. And of course, several, several remote pilot in command can su successively pilot the same RPA during a given flight through endovers. We'll see that also in the scenarios. Okay, the principle number 10 states that only one RPA may be controlled by one RPS also at any given time. Following to the uh, design and certificate of airworthiness, uh, the distributed na nature of the system requires that the uh, design approval scope expands from the aircraft, the RPA itself, to include also the stations. Possibly the stations can be of various types. It also includes the C2Link and any other components of the system to enable safe flight from takeoff to landing. The RPA will hold a certificate of airworthiness and a registration which is issued by the state of registry. Uh, the RPS de design takes into account potential loss of the C2Link and appropriate abnormal or emergency procedures should be established to cope with such a situation. The RPS as a system uh, so comprised of the aircraft, the stations, and C2 links is, provi is provided an implicit design approval through a type certificate issued to the RPA itself, but including the RPSs and the C2 links. C similarly, the RPA receives an individual airworthiness approval through a certificate of airworthiness which includes the RPSs and C2Link equipment. And the principle 16 states that RPA is certificated and certificate documentation lists all components. The RPA received the certificate of airworthiness for the entire uh, system based on the RPA uh, type certificate and associated um, type design. An RP is considered airworthy when an RPS, it's a bit uh, complicated, but um, this is an important part. So it's considered airworthy when the system, which includes the RPA, the RPSs, and the potential C2 links, have been demonstrated to conform to an approved uh, type design and is compliant with the um, instruction for continuing our sinus through maintenance actions or inspections. Also, an RPA should be equipped in accordance with operational equipage requirements applicable for specific operations, the so type and the class of airspace and flight rules. The station must likewise meet the equipage requirements. And this is not a station handover, but it's speaker handover. So, Filippo, please. Thank you. Patrice, so uh, one of the principles which we set is that the RPA needs a certificate of airworthiness, like any other aircraft. The problem is that the RPA alone does not fly, because it needs also a remote pilot station, and when coupled, the two are a remotely piloted aircraft system. So we need to give a certain design approval even to the RPS, to the remote pilot station. Looking at what we do today in aviation, often authorities issue type certificates to engines or type certificates to propellers. 
and after they are integrated into the aircraft and covered by the aircraft certificate. So the idea which we proposed in principle 19 is that the station may have its own type certificate. No more and no less than what we do today for engines and propellers. However, may, because uh, we may still certify the entire RPS, RPAS, without a prior type approval of the RPS, or maybe that there are even alternative ways instead of a type certificate like TSO authorizations or similar. Anyway, the idea is to follow established practices for manned aviation. Then, C2 link comprises both equipment, transceivers and antennas at both sides of the communication path, but also a wave in the middle, which we can say that is a service. The hardware and software of the physical components of the C2 link will be in the scope of the type certificate. Like today, a navigation receiver or a radio on board is covered by the type certificate of the aircraft. The wave which comes out from the transceiver cannot be certified, but the radio, yes. And then, to make things even more complex, the path between the transceiver on board the remotely piloted aircraft and the receiving and transmitting equipment at the level of the station may not necessarily be directly in radio line of sight. It may go over intercontinental ranges, so requiring wide area networks or satellite communications. And possibly, possibly, these communication devices will not neither be managed by the holder of the type certificate nor by the operator. I don't think that uh, a company producing ARPAS will put in orbit satellites and the same. I don't think that an ARPAS operator will manage satellite constellation. So possibly we will have a third party communication service provider in the middle. And we have spent considerable time discussing this question. In the end, in the end, we concurred on principle 21, the quality of service required, alias the minimum performances which the link should provide in terms of transaction time, availability, continuity and integrity, these should be specified by the TC holder. So, decided by the TC holder, of course, demonstrated by the TC holder to the state of design and covered by the TC. Then, uh, as maybe my friend Patrice already said, only the aircraft is registered, of course, with the state of registry, principle 22. 23, the station is not registered, because normally does not fly, and also because the same station may serve different aircraft in different days, or the same aircraft may be handed over from one station to another. So the operator needs to identify the station, have the authorization by the state of the operator, and maintains a record of which station has been used with which aircraft during a given flight. Then we might even have, this is principle 24, different legal entities which will not operate remotely piloted aircraft, but will only offer services of the remote pilot station, including the related remote pilot. Uh, if you look at the maritime sector, since centuries we have the harbor pilots, which go on board and support the ship to enter 
in an harbor where navigation is particularly difficult in narrow waters. Here is more or less the same principle. There might be a company specialized in landing RPA at Hong Kong, which manages a number of stations which are compatible with the aircraft operated by their customers, and this company serves the operator. If you want, this is a sort of wet lease for manned aircraft, although the RPS provider does not operate any aircraft. But we uh, believe that the principle is that even these service providers should be under oversight, and in any case, the contract between this service provider and the ARPAS operator should be approved by the authority of the state of operation, because the ultimate responsibility is for the operator and the state of operation. Uh, to see the relationship between the C2Link service provider and the operator, let's hope that this graph helps. So, we start from the ARPAS design on the top, which leads to an RPA type certificate, and of course there is an older of that cer type certificate, and the older is responsible for the data sheet attached to the type certificate. This data sheet should include the required quality of services, of service for the link, defined by a number of parameters. Then, if an operator does not hire any third party, provides the service for the link by himself, the operator is responsible to maintain the quality of service, to monitor it and to intervene if something goes wrong. Alternatively, look at the left side. The operator may take responsibility to operate the aircraft and one or more stations during the flight, but may decide to establish a contract with a C2Link service provider. Fine. Or another operator on the right might decide not only to contract the C2Link service provider, but also to contract the service provider of the remote pilot station. So there could be two very relevant subcontractor of the operator, which require some requirements and some form of oversight, because they uh, are critical for the safety of operation. In particular, for the C2Link service provider, as we said a few minutes ago, this is the link between the remote pilot and the mobile surfaces. Once it was self-contained in the aircraft, now it travels over radio wave. So the degradation or interruption or loss of this command and control link is much worse than losing communication with air traffic control, because it may mean that the pilot is no longer able to govern the flight. And so we believe that we need standards a bit more detailed than what we have today in Annex 10 for the communication service provider. Actually, there is almost nothing in Annex 10 on the service providers today. For the handover, said during the flight, because of geographical considerations or because of endurance consideration, the operator may decide that at a certain point in time, the uh, control of the aircraft would be handed over from one station to another station. And usually this would mean even handing over the remote piloting command responsibility, because the uh, delivering station will no longer be able to govern the aircraft and so the remote pilot in command has to be with the active RPS. So during the flight we need procedures which the operator has to define based on information provided by the manufacturers on the handover between the remote pilot station. Principle 26, then 
The same station now could be used to fly one aircraft and in three hours from now may be paired with another aircraft. So there is no rigid bionivocal connection between a station and an aircraft. And that's why principle 27 in the type certificate, we also need to list which models of station are compatible with that model of aircraft. Like today, an airliner might be uh, equipped with Rolls-Royce engines or with General Electric engines. The operator will choose which engines, but both models need to be in the data sheet attached to the type certificate. And conversely, principle 28, one station may also, one model of station may be compatible with different types of remotely piloted aircraft. And 29 is the opposite. Then we have discussed so far a lot about the operator. But of course, we need also to involve the states for safety oversight. So we have the state of operator, which delivers the ARPAS operator certificate, and of course, maintains continuous oversight after this delivery. In uh, the recently approved amendment to Annex 1, we have decided that the authority issuing the remote pilot station is the state of operator. This is a departure from the tradition. Traditionally, it was the state of registry. But now we are giving more relevance to the operations. Not surprising, not surprising. We know from the history of aviation that in the last two or three decades, catastrophes originated by technical failures have been around 10%. In the other cases, these were due to human errors, environmental factors, or operations. And so we need to give, with the present status of the art, more emphasis to operations than to the bare machines. Engineers have become very good in designing technical devices. So there we might have less problems. Then principle 33, we need some form of oversight even for the C2Link communication service provider. And so there would be a competent authority which endorses that this organization is safe enough to deliver services. This may happen or may not happen. As a contingency measure, if the service provider is not approved by any competent authority, then oversight has to be through the certified operator and through the safety management of the operator. The principle is the same principle of the ground handling. In a number of ICAO contracting states, ground handlers are not certified by the authority, but then the customers of the ground handlers the air operators, the commercial air operators, have to oversee the safety of ground handling. And here we are saying the same principle. Although, although the activity of a ground handler might be much simpler than the activity of an airline, here this C2Link communication is quite a complex system, and maybe that some operators might not be skilled enough for this oversight, but the principle we are embedding in Annex 6. Then, the oversight of the station could be by the authority of the state where the station is located. However, since the station is essential for the operation, this should be after agreement with the state of the operator. What remains in our current vision, similar to traditional aviation, is that continuing airworthiness. Continuing airworthiness, like it has always been, would remain responsibility of the state of registry. And finally, 
new service providers. I said before that in 2020, we plan to recommend to the ANC the new part four of Annex 6. Simultaneously, we already have in our drawers a proposal for amendment of Annex 19, coordinated with the safety management panel. And there, we believe that there would be three service providers to be included or to be interpreted in Annex 19. Training organizations, we already have them in Annex 19. And of course, if they train for manned aircraft or for unmanned aircraft, they are still training organization in the scope of Annex 19. So no modification to the wording of the Annex, but the scope would become wider. Then we need to include operators of remotely piloted aircraft holding a rock and authorized for international operations. Otherwise, they are beyond the scope of ICAO. Finally, we need also approved maintenance organizations, like for manned aircraft, when serving the operators in the row above. However, we said that there will be two additional service providers, the C2Link service provider and the station service provider. These are not in the draft of Annex 19, and so for the time being, we will say something, or we intend to say something, into new part four of Annex 6. Then whether in 20 years from now they will migrate in Annex 19, I don't know. But for the time being, they will be covered in Annex 6. And with this, last handover of this flight for landing. Thank you, Filippo. Last handover on the, the other side of uh, Cherry and Ron. Is, uh, is that ensure the quality of the presentation. Now, uh, I'll go very quickly to leave time for questions and answers as we are running out of time. So the last two slides is just uh, some pictures. So maybe to sum up a little bit all the principles that we've seen. So it's not that easy. It's a bit uh, complicated. But here you can see uh, uh, that the flight uh, is under the responsibility of the operator, which holds the uh, uh, rock. And he can contract to a service provider, as Filippo just said, or to a station service provider. And for the other side, uh, Filippo just said which state is doing what. And the last slide, uh, it's a little bit to see uh, how you can uh, hand over from one station to another to another during the same flight. And uh, all the uh, stakeholders which are at stake and uh, responsibility. And in the blue shaded area is the uh, 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 showing the uh, uh, safety management system of the operator. Thank you very much. I think it's time for questions. Okay, thanks very much. Um, I suspect for most of the people from the RPAS panel here, none of that should be a massive surprise to you because we've been working through that um, for a long period. But obviously for those of the youth who are not from the RPAS panel, um, it's a, a short summary, a shortish summary of what um, we've been trying to do over the last few years in terms of establishing some sort of specific um, ideas and, and principles going forward. So um, I'd like to open the floor to questions as much as anything, primarily from the non-ARPAS panel people, that if there are any questions, then uh, please feel free to, to ask at the moment. Yes, sir. Zeno um, One short question. Um, could you again clarify uh, how you distinguish between Annex 19 and Annex 6 in the, in the uh, three slides before the last one? This, this wasn't really clear to me. Sorry. Yes. Uh, yes, you see that in this slide there are five rows. First line, training organizations. They are already in Annex 19. They will remain there. 
and whether they train onboard pilots or remote pilots, they remain in the scope of Annex 19. So the scope would become larger. The wording of the Annex 19 may not need to be changed. Second row, today in Annex 19, we have operators holding, of operators of manned aircraft, holding an AOC and authorized for international operations in accordance with Annex 6, but part one, commercial air transport by aeroplanes. So we have agreed with the safety management panel just to insert two lines mentioning the ROC and Annex 6 Part 4. So the spirit and intent is the same, the reference is different. Then, still in Annex 19, we already have in the list of service provider maintenance of organization related to manned aircraft and refer to part one of Annex 6, and we will have one more paragraph, maintenance of organizations of RPA serving the utilized by operators in the row above. So these first three rows have been discussed and agreed between the ARPAS panel and the safety management panel. During the further work of the ARPAS panel, it emerged progressively that we need also to give some attention to the organization of the service provider in the last two rows. In Annex 19, if I remember, there is the provision that something which is specific to a certain domain may have safety management provision in the vertical annex for that domain. And if I remember, in fact, in part one of Annex 6, we have a couple of paragraphs with additional provisions for air operators of commercial air transport by aeroplanes. So in addition to Annex 19, these operators need to comply with two or three paragraphs in part one of Annex 6. And so since, for the time being, we consider the, the time is not yet mature to uh, say that these new providers will need a fully fledged safety management system, we would prefer to propose to have some specific provision in Annex 6. And then the experience will tell us whether it's necessary to move them in Annex 19 or not. Thank you very much. Just add a quick thank you there to Philippo, who obviously is encyclopedic knowledgeable. This has been uh, very helpful throughout. But uh, any more questions? Yes, yes sir. Uh, yes, under that uh, RPS service provider there, where would the um, RPS pilots be certified and how would, how would the operational control work? You use the maritime equivalent of harbor pilots and a little, could you elaborate on that a little bit? Yes, the Council has already adopted amendment, if I remember, 175 to Annex 1, anyway, the last amendment to Annex 1, where the Council stated that the license to the remote pilot shall be issued by the state of the operator. Whoever is the employer of this remote pilot, the license has to be issued or validated by the state of the operator. So should an European company decide to contract remote pilot station services from a company established in Singapore, since the operator is European, the license to the pilot in Singapore should be either issued or validated by the state of the operator. So maybe that this girl or boy will have an original license issued by the Singapore authority, but that license should be validated by the state of the operator. Or conversely, maybe that the license is directly issued by the state of the operator. So whoever, whoever is the legal entity responsible for the services of the station, 
the standards for the pilot license are already there and centered on the state of operator. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, Chris O from the FAA, Flight Standards. On principle 23, I don't know if you can go back to that slide. For it says the R if the RPAS is not registered, but its identification is the responsibility of the operator. What exactly do you mean by its identification? The serial number, model and serial number. You know that even on an aircraft today, there are a number of uh, equipment, of uh, systems which are installed on board. For instance, the engine, the engine might have a type certificate, it has a serial number, but at the level of authority, there is not a registry from the engines. Nevertheless, the operator has to maintain under control the configuration of the aircraft. And when an engine is removed and another one is fitted on the aircraft, this has to be recorded. The difference here is that the station can change without any intervention by the maintenance staff. Because you may have end over during the flight, but then the operator electronically, or on paper, but okay, nowadays is electronically, will have to record precisely at which moment the control was transferred from one station to another station, and the location of these stations should be identified, the serial number, and so on. So it has to be recorded in so, case something happens. So the, the RPS, though, is still a, a certificated type of equipment? In other words, I mean, it still has a standards that it must it must be certified against and so then the state of the operator is responsible whether it's registered amongst the RPAS components or just identified to, to, to responsible for the performance and the capability of that system? The principles are the same for manned aviation. So there are from the airworthiness point of view two levels of approval. One is at design level mm -hmm and the other one is for the individual produced piece of equipment. At design level, the models of station, which could be more than one, which are compatible with a certain model of aircraft, have to be covered by the type certificate issued by the aircraft. To simplify the certification work of the integrated system, Maybe, like for the engines, that the station might have its own type certificate. And so the integrator of the system will only demonstrate the integration at design level. Then, at the level of COV, there is a configuration associated with the COV, this configuration will be maintained by the operator and the serial numbers of the stations which are actually used should be part of the configuration maintained under control. Okay. I had one other question. Um, if I have the floor. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, principle 33. Yeah. So the, the C2, that's the C2 uh, communication service provider. Um, oversight is done by the state of that. So if I, if I understand C2, C2 is both command and control and communication, is it more of a C3? Command, control, and communication? Not necessarily. It's command and control, C2, link communication service provider, not end communication. Okay. Because C2 is a form of communication, but main is not related to ATC communications. Well, yeah, because to me it doesn't, it's not at all related. It shouldn't be. I mean, we're talking command control, right? You're talking about the ability to actually maneuver, change the flight, yes. change the direction, change the, you know, yes. trajectory of it. Okay, it just seems kind of that, that, that oversight being done by, by the state providing that on a long, you know, multiple states, it seems to me that could be a bit problematic. Um, could be. Indeed, here we are digging new ground. We have to see in reality how oversight would actually be implemented. But in this moment, we do not have an established system in our back. So I would assume that if Iridium 
wants to provide these type of services, Iridium <laughs> would come to the FAA because they are established in the US, they're headquartered, they will get some form of approval. And then the authorities of the other ICAO contracting states could accept this approval and validate or not, we will see. But personally, I would not find realistic that the Civil Aviation Authority of San Marino will challenge an approval given by the FAA. Neither I would uh, foresee that this service provider is operating worldwide would need hundreds of approvals. Victor Robeck, Ayata. It was also mentioned uh, that you need to certify the uh, remote piloted uh, stations, not just the pilots or, or the, the aircraft itself, but the station as well. Um, is there any experience uh, according to what OPSPECs that would occur? Because I have no experience in that at all. We do not have a lot of experience, of course, in the certification of the station. But if we look at the traditional large aeroplanes, on board of the aircraft there are a lot of pieces, millions of different parts. All these parts are subject to a certain form of standards. For instance, uh, uh, rivets, uh, nuts and bolts, uh, alloys, these are all standardized, not by aviation, but there are industry standards and there are certain methods to ensure conformity. Then the majority of instruments and avionic equipments are subject to a technical standard order and they have their authorization issued by EASA, FAA or other authorities. So that equipment is certified on the basis of a technical standard order when it leaves the factory. Then all these, then the engines and the propellers often come with their own type certificate. All these pieces were standardized by industry, whether based on a TSO, whether coming with a type certificate based on a certain certification specification, in the end are integrated in the aircraft. In our case, they will be integrated in the system even beyond the aircraft, and the TC holder for the entire system will be responsible for the integration. So if a piece, if a radio, comes with its TSO authorization, the integrator will only demonstrate that the installation has been done properly and there are no mutual interferences with other equipment, but will not repeat testing to demonstrate the basic performances of the radio. The same would be for the station. That's why for the one we are saying may have its type certificate. But whether it has this type certificate or not, in the end, it has to be covered by the type certificate of the entire system. So there should be no gaps. Okay, any more for any more, dare I say it? Right, okay, thank, thanks very much. Oh, sorry, yes, there is. Yes, sir. Yeah. Thomas Yacono, uh, French uh, CA. Um, can you please uh, confirm that uh, principals are considering only uh, that the RPA will fly under IFR rules, and so VFR are not considered or authorized? This is what we see around, that industry is not investing in developing technologies to fly VFR, because if you want to fly VFR, for instance, you need to assess the distance from the clouds. Uh, we already have difficulty with detect and avoid in relation to cooperative targets. With the clouds, it's even more difficult. And in this moment, it seems that the industry finds it's not safety beneficial. In any case, all RPS are equipped with advanced navigation equipment. So for them, flying IFR is much cheaper and easier than VFR. And so that's why, for the moment, we felt that this is the priority. For the small UAS, which are beyond the scope of ICAO, the priority is visual line of sight, VLOS, which is, according to some colleagues, not exactly VFR. 
because for instance you don't need to stay five nautical miles away from the clouds if the range of your operation is 20 meters. Okay, fine. And just to add to that, of course, that is part of within the scope that we've given was, as I re we'll reiterate again throughout, is international IFR and within controlled airspace. So that's the, the scope of the, uh, the level we're being given at the moment. So um, I think that's probably about it for now. We could probably do with a, a, a short break. We'll, t we'll take 15 minutes, if you can, for a, a short break. Um, come back at um, 10 past three, please. And then we'll um, we'll carry on with the next bit, which are the uh, a, a talk through the the various scenarios that um, have been developed to try and explain how the uh, the RFAS principles grow as as they get more complex. So we'll see you again here at, at uh, ten past three. Thanks very much.